here at the Faculty Factory Podcast, and I'm Kim Skorupski here at Hopkins looking at Dr. Mary Beth Phelan. Hi, Mary Beth. Hi, Kim. I'm so happy you're here, Mary Beth, that I met, oh my gosh, years ago when the Professional Development Conference for the AAMC GFA was in Chicago. I remember meeting her in the poster presentation. We chatted. You were so kind, Mary Beth, to talk about the podcast. I was just thinking about it and just getting it up and running, and you were so supportive and encouraging to me. And I can't remember how we reached out. I think I know right before COVID, you had been um, given and had this opportunity to do your new, your new role as vice chair for faculty development advancement and looking to connect with people and trying to um, just reach out and learn more about this new position. But folks, let me tell you, I'm getting ahead of myself. Who is Dr. Mary Beth Phelan? Uh, Mary Beth is an MD, MBA professor of emergency medicine, the vice chair for faculty development and advancement, the chief of the division of emergency medicine ultrasound, director of the advanced emergency ultrasound fellowship in the department of emergency medicine at the medical college of Wisconsin. And Dr. Phelan is also, I just learned the chair of the promotion and tenure committee. So lots and lots of responsibilities, Mary Beth. And I'm so happy that you're here to talk with us today about a topic we've never really covered. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for encouraging me for reaching out and being a part of this community. Well, thank you so much for having me, Kim. I listen to your podcast regularly and just gain so many insights and ideas from the community. And thank you for creating the community. I'm really grateful that um, you and your team have have done this. And um, I also sent your e- your new ebook to all of our faculty. So um, you always have wonderful, wonderful topics and ideas and thoughts to help to for all of us to grow in our faculty uh, academic faculty journey. So thank you, and I'm really honored to be part of the um, the podcast and. Um, the topic I wanted to talk about today was the skill set of writing letters for uh, promotion. And this uh, first came to uh, me as a technical skill that I had never learned. And I was new in my role in, um, as a vice chair for faculty development and advancement. And there are a lot of letters that need to be written, award letters, letters for people to attend Um, you know, certain faculty development courses, letters of support, but the one that really is technical and really plays a huge role for faculty development is that letter for promotion. Mm -hmm. Um, I was fortunate to have my um, new chair as a mentor, Dr. Ian Martin, who is a wonderful letter writer. And uh, he, he guided me, he coached me, he gave me really good, solid feedback with lots of red (laughs) on my first letters. And I cringe when I think about letters I I wrote maybe right after I became an associate professor and think, oh, my goodness, the P&T committee must have been like, wow, good thing the faculty member's so strong. (laughs) The letter did not matter as much. So I was really grateful for his uh, mentorship and guidance, and it led me to think more about how can um, I share this with our faculty. And the first iteration of our letter writing uh, training came with our, we have a women's faculty council in our Department of Emergency Medicine. And so my my colleague, Dr. Amy Zozel, and I did a couple of letter writing sessions and faculty really, um, really enjoyed that and really felt like they um, gained some skills that they didn't have. So um, if you've ever gotten a request to write a promotion letter for a referee letter, um, remember it's a great honor to be asked. And these letters really matter. In my role as the chair of, on the promotion and tenure committee, I see these letters. I see how um, artfully someone can weave a um, uh, just the story of someone's career and have a diverse group of people on a promotion and tenure committee. You know, I'm an emergency physician. We have surgeons, we have pediatricians, we have microbiologists, we have biochemists. So this is a diverse group of faculty that need to come to the same conclusion. And so the the letter you're writing um, really impacts uh, the committee decision. And I would highly recommend if you're embarking on your first few, find someone that you can say, hey, can you read this? Give me some feedback. How is it landing? Um, What am I missing? Uh, That's really important. And I think that the common thread to think of through all of this is balancing advocacy for the faculty member with authenticity. Um, You don't want to go 
um, overboard on things, but you really do want to be, you would want to write this letter from the lens of being an advocate and being authentic. So if we look at the broad sort of steps, um, one is you're going to receive an email or you're going to receive a request. It could be from your own Office of Faculty Affairs, which is what happens with our institution. They manage all of that. Some institution that's going to come from the chair or from the vice chair um, for faculty development and advancement. And the, you know, there's a sort of three R's, the receive, reflect. Am I, do I have the capacity at this time to write the letter in the time frame that I um, want to? And then respond. So when a little bit about uh, reflection, um, reflection is going to look like, um, what kind of letter is this? Is this a mentee that I'm writing for? Am I a division chief and I'm writing for someone in my division? Or is this an arm's length? I don't know this person. Um, the, the letters are going to be very, very different. Um, if I'm writing as the person's division chief or me uh, mentor, mentee, I identify that early in the letter. If I'm an ar arm's length reviewer, I explicitly say I don't personally know the candidate, nor have I worked or collaborated with her, just so that it's very, very um, explicit. Other um, uh, reflections to think about is what are your identities and positionality? What does the institution want? And do your research a little bit on the candidate. It could be they're going to send you a packet, so that should be easy for you. A couple of things to about reflecting on your identities and positionality. Um, are you someone who thinks that the most valuable research is created as an independent person, a pioneer? That's cool. And can you acknowledge also that someone's a team player? And they're a really, really important member of a team. And while they may not be the first author or be the PI on the grant, they may, you know, look for that. Are they the critical person? Do they did they create a product or um, a system that um, allows this research to move forward? And um, they, the research couldn't be done without them. Do you value quantity over quality? Um, if you need, if there's like this N in your head of the number of papers or presentations, is that going to bias you as a letter writer? Or is this something you'd be open to looking at, you know, uh, the quality of the work, even if it's not necessarily meeting um, a, a number that you might have in your head? Um, are you someone who is less open to new ways of scholarship, such as um, podcasts, <laughs> such as um, it, uh, X, you know, I like to I like the Twitter better to say say it like that. But but individuals are really successfully and impactfully disseminating their education and their work in this way. So think about, you know, whether or not you value that, and and if it would bias you if this person has a, a portfolio um, or dossier that's heavy in that. Um, so, so really important uh, areas for res reflection. Then you want to respond to the request, and I wish I could say I was I was going I was good at this saying and within two to three days of getting the request. It doesn't always work like that, but that is that's the ideal. Um, let them know. Consider the timeline. Generally, I'm given a one to two month window, and most of the letters I'm being asked to write, um, I have a true north. Um, number one, I'm I'm on a, a writers bureau for the academic. Uh, Academy for Women in Academic Emergency Medicine. So if there's a woman who's being promoted to professor, I'm writing that letter. Um, also, if this is a woman who's, particularly if she is in point of care ultrasound, I'm writing that letter. But let's say the next two months is just completely jammed for me. I will write back and say, I can't do it in two months, but I could have it to you in three. Does that work? And that gives them the option to go, yeah, we can wait another month or no, we really can't. We're going to move on. So um, don't be afraid to ask for an extension. I've done that and, and it's it's um, worked out fine because I really want to um, to to be able to help. And, and this is actually something we should all consider to be a service to those coming up. When you were promoted, people did this for you. <laughs> Oh. And um, now you have the opportunity to give back to your specialty. Speaking about Writers Bureau, and 
I think if you don't have one in your um, specialty, this would be something great to start. Um, you know, we have the uh, Academy for Women in Academic Emergency Medicine has a huge list of women where they're experts at, assistants, um, pardon me, associate or professor. And um, it's just a great way for you to to, um, to give back and to create sort of a, a library or a, a, a number of people who would be available to write letters. So the um, right May I interrupt? The, the Writers yes. Bureau is in and of itself a collective of women who are just saying, ask me? Is that yeah. what the... Oh, yeah. okay. I thought you... Yeah. I, was, I was thinking it's a, that you go and you somehow you write together or you do yeah. projects. No, it's just someone... It's people who are kindly saying, um, here, count me in on the repository of people who would be willing to support and endorse. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful thing. It, it's re it's really really cool, and all the women in our department who are associate or above are on this um, writers bureau. So you know, if you're a chair, vice chair, trying to help a, a faculty member, because this is I'm finding this in my role. People really struggle with the referee letter. They they're like, well, I don't know that person. I go, you don't have to. Um, it's ideal if you pick someone who's in your area of interest. So if you're an educator, if they're an educator, they can really speak to how you've influenced um, the you know, the system that, that you're working with. And so it's, it's almost better. And, and all of us are willing to do this. That's why we put our names out there. So Mary Beth, so like, is, is, so I'm thinking of a speaker's bureau. So if one puts together a speaker's bureau, it'd say, okay, Mary Beth has expertise. She's going to talk about emergency ultrasound and domestic violence. And, and Kim Skorupski's on this bureau. She'll talk about faculty development or, you know, late career faculty members um, coaching, I, you're, I know you're a new certified coaching and from the, um, the Physician Coaching Institute. That would be like a speaker's bureau, what we could talk on. So the writer's bureau, similarly, do you say expertise in yes. you know education so that someone could say, I, I have a candidate who, and yes. then, okay, that's perfect. Perfect. It's, it's really great. And I know, um, I believe there are some um, organizations in family medicine that have this as well. And so okay, if, if anyone else is thinking, wow, that would be great. Um, think about putting it together for your specialty or for your organization, um, or even for your, your hospital. To be that, yeah, your that's a great, that would be a great school. project for someone in a leadership program. Yes. Uh, or just trying to be of service in their professional leadership, their society. Yeah, that's a great idea, Mary Beth. Okay, great. Yes. And so I frequently get a lot of requests. This is the time of year too, where, where promotion processes are picking up and letter writing is is happening. Um, another thing to you know, in responding, if you read the materials and you're not sure, pick up the phone, right? G give someone a phone call. Say, hey, I'm help me out, help me understand this, um, just so that you can clarify whether or not you can. You feel like you can spend you you can write the letter for the candidate. So don't be afraid to do that. <laughs> Mary Beth, what are, what are your thoughts on using a template letter? Or, um, you know, so a, an outline of a structure that you use repeatedly. I have a file folder in Word that I, you know, referee letters. Yes. And, and I just, they're sorted, obviously, by by date. And so I open up the most recent one. And if it's close enough, I just modify that letter to stick with the same kind of cadence and, and just format and trying to be objective. And as you said, not, you know, not making it pouring it on too much you want to be a strong advocate but you want to be authentic i don't want to be using too many uh, superlatives and because some people I, I do i tend to be very emotional and i re really pile on the adjectives so i using the template helps me to organize myself and then also um makes it more manageable because sometimes i get these requests and i think oh my gosh and then you know you open up some of these cvs and they're 50 pages long and and the, and the instructions are really detailed. And I'm thinking, this is not going to be a half a day job. This is going to be a couple of days of, of work for me. And when we all have things to do, it is one of those kind of like, oh, you want to do it. But you're like, really, really? And so any way that you can help us or give some advice to us to not only remind us, as you did so kindly and, and very you know lovingly, that this is an honor. This is it's. um to be asked is is an honor and it's a privilege and and to remind ourselves. I know when I got promoted, 
here at Hopkins to professor, I was the only, to my knowledge, and some I'm waiting for somebody to correct me here at Hopkins, the first PhD woman to be promoted to professor in the School of Medicine with my degrees were in sociology. And here I was a full-time faculty development person. So I know my GFA friends, our group on faculty affairs community rallied. They wrote the letters because the field of faculty affairs, faculty development is, is new. It is a field of practice. And so there's nobody else that could write these letters. So I know it was my, my people, my GFA family. So I, of course, I'm like, I'm going to give back, you know, way more than was given to me, but it's still, so knowing that and humbling myself and being, okay, yes, it's still kind of like, oh, so what tools or tricks or hints do you have to help us overcome that hurdle to making it more efficient for us? Well, I think um, if you, so if you, you definitely look at the guidelines, Um, I feel like there's two types of people, like you're going to get guidelines. I'm someone that will start to build something without reading the instructions. And I only did that once with a letter (laughs) because when I finally went back to read the instructions, you're like, oh, oh boy, I got to redo it. So look at the instructions. I think that um, when we get to the to the structure of the letter, um, you you that's a that's a great question, and that's that's perfect. So you have an, you're going to have things that aren't going to change. Your opening statement is really just going to change with the the candidate's name and their where they're how they're being promoted. Make sure you read those instructions to um, include the pathway that the organization you're writing the letter for has, and not your not not the one at your institution if if it's an external one. Your qualifications. Why are you being selected to write this letter? That's something that is standard. Um, think you can be adding things like, you know, when I became the chair of the of the um, the tenure committee, that's something to add there. Like, hey, you know, I get to see these letters. I'm those are one of the qualifications that um, I'm, I'm using. So those types of things can be templated, and you can just start with that. Um, then you want to create sections based on what the promotion criteria are. And so that would be gen- the general you know, pattern is education, research and scholarship, clinical service, uh, MCW starting community engagement, which is really, really, uh, really important. And so you want to um, th- so then create the structure in the body of your letter, and then you want to follow that by a conclusion. Um, there are some things um, I, I can, I don't know if it would help, Kim, if I sent you a few um, resources after we're done, oh. just so you could link, I don't know if you link, you could oh, link well, them to the podcast. Absolutely. I was just going to ask you, is, is there any way you could share a sample letter sure. redacted information yes um, i would be happy to do that I, I would be happy to do that and i have a resource here you know to kind of elevate descriptions of of the competencies right so and they they've got them grouped into an analytical critical thinking innovative creative um you know innovation and creativity productive or productivity leadership enthusiasm um and they're and they're very um gender neutral words robust unprecedented, accomplished. And um, when uh, my colleague, Dr. Zolzel speaks to this, you'll you you you'll see how th- there is gender bias and there's actually a gender bias tool that she'll talk about that you can pop your letter into to make sure that you're, you're balanced. Because there are words that we should use more with men that right. are considered to be more feminine and vice versa. So um, I think that, um, that, th- that, Seeing these articles, kind of getting um, inspired by some of the the, the wording is um, is really um, important. So um, one of the things in the opening statement, just for a few details, you want to provide um, context, right? How are you writing this letter? And uh, just I'll read that you've indicated that Dr. ABC identified X as her area of excellence. And how are you writing that letter? Um, I am doing this based on her um, CV, her personal statement, and the uh, um, you know uh, research or manuscripts she's written. And they might send you some. I tend to go down a rabbit hole and maybe find one or two um, to 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 look at so that I get a little more context. Um, and so that opening statement, as you were alluding to, can be the same. So you can create that, and that's your your first page of your letter um, is done if you've got your opening statement and your reviewer qualification. Um, 
And then you want to assess how the candidate's work is meeting each area that they are um, being measured in. And I tend to start again in a, um, so local, what are they doing at their institution, regional, national, international. Hmm. And I try to do that um, because at our institution, there's, you know, an emphasis on we want to see regional, national, then national, international. Um, and so telling what they've done for the institution is really important, too, because the the um, committee wants to see that. But then they want to see how you've been influenced, how you have influenced others outside of the walls of the um, institution. Don't really list don't make a list of the candidate activities. And um, that's it's tempting to do that. Um, but really um, showing how their activities have uh, created a positive impact. One thing you could do that might work that we we did initially when we were we did a like 45 CV review when I first started in my role, like in our department, which was a lot, we created a um uh, a faculty CV checklist based on our institutions. Um, you know, what they emphasized. So you might consider having that available and you can just kind of go through your the, the person's um, CV and their um, portfolio or personal statement and you can check things off so you have them there. I, I don't do that anymore, but that's one thing that's um, possible to, um, to do. Um, evaluate that candidate in each area using both objective and some subjective data. So, um, you know, you talk about how this one candidate dedicated her academic career to excellence and service through advancing medical education. And then what's my take on it? Um, her expertise has built bridges between specialties to ensure that important discoveries from her research are leveraged. So really trying to bring what you're seeing is valuable um, from the candidate in there in addition to their objective um, uh, data. Um so then you one other thing you should do is quantify. Um, so one candidate had work at nine campuses impacting 1,400 students. Um, so that that brings to a committee that, again, who is going to have a microbiologist and emergency physician um, and, you know, a diverse committee can go, wow, that that's very meaningful. <laughs> that person has has done, um, you know, uh, a lot. Then you want to, at the very end of each of those sections, put together a sentence. I, I have, again, this, this is a templated sentence. They meet or exceed the criteria for promotion to X on X pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then making, again, a subjective statements like the body of work, um, you know, it uh, really contributes to, you know, clinicians and patients at um, the and I called it excellent medical university for uh, for you know as a um, as a name. Um, a couple of other things that you might want to keep in mind that are out maybe um, not as typical. Um, you know how are they achieving things through mentorship? Yeah. Um, very very important uh, to include that if, um, for instance, um, Dr. Zolzel is somebody who I would say you know eighty five percent of her research is conducted with um, learners who are you know seventy eight percent were were women, and so really showing the impact that she is having with um, with her her research, um, quantifying the number of um, presentations and perhaps an impact factor if that is. Um, if that's appropriate. And then again, um, go, you know, kind of repeating that through each topic, education, research, scholarship. Then at the end, you're going to have an overall recommendation um, that I would say should be enthusiastic. You should be able to write it that you enthusiastically, um, you know, support their promotion. One sentence that I think needs to be included in each of these letters that I think people don't recognize that a promotion committee is looking for, they want to know if this candidate would be promoted at your institution. Mm -hmm. And so including that intentionally is really um, important um, for the committee to say, wow, okay, that this, you know, this is, this is a uh, strong letter. Mary Beth, I, that last point is, I think, really important. And you're reminding me that when we're asked to write these letters, 
that that almost kind of um, requires or assumes that we have the knowledge, that we really do understand at our own institutions, what are the criteria? So rather than just kind of flippantly tossing that that statement out there, would 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 not, or some institutions like nobody would ever get promoted there. So, um, <laughs> but have that check, like you mentioned earlier, a checklist. That would be another tool that I suppose one could ask. I'm thinking here at Hopkins, if someone is just now newly promoted, so they're going to start being asked to give letters or referee letters to other candidates that that might be a nice way to circle back to say, I'm now being asked, is there a tool that has been developed that I could use as a letter writer or might I, maybe I could contribute and help my own institution by creating such a thing that would just be used purposely for external letter writing that would just kind of give an overall snapshot. So I'm, I, I'm just thinking about this whole process. Great idea you know, that that would be another way to help us. Because then as soon as you said that, I thought, well, how do I, how do I know? I barely know how I got promoted or it was so <laughs> long ago. Or to your point earlier, you know, when we're honest and recognize our own biases, I got promoted so many years ago. I don't know what all this social stuff is. And I don't know what a, a blog and a vlog and X and and all these things. I, I can't, maybe I don't feel... Um, competent to judge that. I don't know what kind of, how how does one look at impact? So how would I measure that impact if someone has a lot of stuff on social? So I think it kind of, um, it's an opportunity to stay current, Yes, you know, in learning what, what are the new, you know, AI, how is this, you know, how is research being, being disseminated and shared? So it's an opportunity to learn, but like anything we learn, once we get, you know, comfortable there we can then develop tools and efficiencies and as you're laying out you know have nice templates and just ways of kind of setting things up so you're not reinventing the wheel every single time absolutely and and we have the same thing we have a repository of letters like of, of all the letters we've ever written so that we can go and make it easier mm-hmm. um of course I naturally know our criteria because I'm so embedded. Yeah. Right. And so, I, but I think you make a great point that if you are asked to write the letter, review the Hopkins criteria, can you honestly say that, um, that they would be promoted here? And maybe if it's your first few times, go to a trusted colleague and say, can I write this? Am I missing something? Can I can I say they'll be promoted here? Well, um there. Just so that you're checking in um, and you're not being influenced either by, you know, not deeply understanding all the criteria or not understanding maybe, you know, what uh, the impact. You bring up an idea that um, we do bias training for all of our promotion committees. Um, right. However, I'm and I'm wondering about, you know, updating the pro- promotion committees on, hey, here are some new ways of disseminating um, scholarship. Right. Exactly. There's, there's so, oh my gosh, we had this discussion so long ago, not so long ago, but yeah, the non-traditional funding mechanisms and non-traditional ways of having impact that it's, it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that people want to right away go to how many publications, you know, how many grants without realizing that there are other, other ways now. And so, but you don't know what you don't know. And so, and as a letter writer, though, you can say, um, even though Dr. X is not a PI, this particular genetic discovery has contributed to the success of all the grants he's on. And in fact, he could not, the work could not be done without his discovery. Mm-hmm. And so that is a letter writer, that that would be a almost a responsibility of a letter writer to to look for that and um, to to really consider that. Dr. Bielan, has can we make the assumption that if I'm asked to write a letter for someone, they've obviously, that candidate has obviously gone through the, de- the division, the department, the school, the university. It's being sent to me externally. Is that a fair assumption? I, I, I Have you ever, in other words received a request to to endorse someone and looked at it and go oh my goodness no 
never. Yeah. There's a there's a good uh, most uh, the, the the universities that have asked me have a very strong process for mm-hmm. vetting the candidate and and the materials I receive are remarkable, and so I think um, I think that that's important. That's a great point uh, mm-hmm. to to bring up that th- this person has done the work. Mm-hmm. I need to find the way to. Um, make sure that I'm reflecting that to a diverse committee and and really being a critical thinker about that. Oh, well, that's an interesting insight too. I like how you how you say that because you know part of me always thinks like, come on, people, we know this person's good. Why do we have to go through this whole song and dance? Um, the data speak for themselves. I mean, the record is obvious. It's kind of like why there's so much time and money. It ends up being a part-time job and our poor faculty members who will wait up to like two years to be a professor because what holds it up? The letter writers. It's all with the letter writers. Every, here at Hopkins anyway, um, that's the biggest holdup. It's waiting for those letters to come in. So I, I often think, why do we have to do this? Isn't there a, a better way, but what you just said, Mary Beth, reminded me that this, this kind of goes back to biblical. But like you know, a, a prophet in his or her own village or town is never recognized. That that you kind of almost need that endorsement from outside, saying, "Well, we know she's great. We know he's wonderful." Uh, but we don't want to be biased in supporting our own. Let's ask others from other villages and towns to um, do, you know, an audit, if you will, a forensic audit. Are we being true? Is this true? Do you also see the value in this person? And that that is part, of, I guess, the you know academia. That is part of the the culture of academia to put work out there and have a, be judged by your peers and by people who can recognize that what you're doing is making a difference. It's moving the field, whatever that is, forward in many different ways. So I guess it's just what I'm just talking myself out of is that this is just culture. This is the tradition. This is tradition. And it's it's tough. It's difficult. It's very honorable, worthwhile work, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I have learned so much about what happens in other institutions when I'm given, you know, the opportunity to write a letter for someone. I'm like, oh, what a great idea to do X um, and Y. (laughs) And I also get ideas for people to invite as speakers. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this candidate's amazing. I want her to come and, and, you know, speak at our institution. So it's it's a way to also share the work of your institution with, with other institutions and gain collaborators or not yeah. feel shy about me, you know, walking up to someone at a meeting being like, hey, how's it going? How's your work on X going? Yeah, net- networking. So it's, I guess when I first asked you that question, I kind of lost track of myself, of course. Um, it's when we, when I ask you the question about being, making the assumption that someone is valuable, it's also almost kind of knowing that if they've been conferred at certain levels and now it's reached me, this outsider, Yes. This is not going to be like, oh, golly, this is going to be a bag of worms. This is going to be an ugly mess. It's about a dispute, a mediation or remediation, or I've got to write a letter, a job letter, or give a recommendation for a job for an employee who was not a good employee. That kind of like an icky feeling of like, this is going to be a mess and it's going to be uncomfortable. It's not that feeling. It is the Wow, it this is an honor because this person has is great. They're great. And so I, I gotta find the greatness authentically and learn and be inspired and push myself to make sure I'm current and staying relevant in the field in the space. So it's almost like also like reviewing, I imagine grant art grant applications and peer-reviewed publications. Being a part of that process is work, but if you're being asked to play in the in the in the game, you're you're in it. You're in the game. You're one of us. So that's part of the responsibilities of being an academic. So it's it's feeds it feeds the machine that we are both giving and taking from the process. 
It's a, it, absolutely, absolutely. And in the end, as you mentioned, you do have to make the time. I, I read in I read in an article one article. It takes one to two hours. I go well. I must be on that low end of the bell curve because I'm with you. More like one to two days, and I need to kind of put it down. I need to build time into my calendar. You know, I'm going to do this for an hour every day. You know, and and then I'm going to put it down and revisit it. So you have to be disciplined about it uh, to to meet the deadline. And if if you're finding yourself behind email, like, hey, I, I need another week, everyone's very nice about that. Um, so uh, it's uh, it, it's important. So yes, yeah, no, I agree. It's an it's an honor. It's work, and it's also really service back to um, the you know junior faculty behind us who um, uh, are you know our future uh, in medicine. That's right. Dr. Mary Beth Phelan, I cannot wait to get your colleague, Dr. Amy Zozel. Yes. She talked with us about biases in this. And this is a great topic. I don't want to do any spoiler alerts, but I often have observed different adjectives being utilized differentially. And so I often want, I'm guilty of it myself. And I'm like, would I describe a guy this way? Is this right? Is this wrong? Um, I want to help somebody. I don't want to make someone think something different. So this, this is a, it's tough. It's something we have to learn about. So we're going to get Dr. Zozel on here and um, and we'll we'll partner up with this episode. This will be a great partnership. Um, a pair, a pair of a pair of pods, a pair of podcast pods. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and the thing about bias, which is why it's so important to talk about it, is we don't know it. So it's not most of the time it's not intentional. So it's horrifying to see, oh, wow, I did that. How can I unlearn that? How can I learn a different skill so that I can, you know, elevate my skills to that level? So that's, it's not meant to make people feel guilty or bad. It's just awareness. a way to wake that up in your brain and be aware. Oh, awareness, right. Dr. Marybeth Phelan, wonderful. Um, we're going to put on the facultyfactory.org website links to the resources you're going to send me. You can get in touch with Mary Beth at mbphelan, P-H-E-L-A-N, at M-C-W for Medical College of Wisconsin, dot E-D-U. And uh, I'll leave out some parting comments to you, Mary Beth, and thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, well, thank you so much for the invitation. I think the the the, the parting thoughts are when you're writing this letter is that balance advocacy with authenticity. I try to adopt the mindset of a neutral but nurturing referee. Optimize readability for uh, all the people on the committee and structure. And as Dr. Zozel will tell you to, um, you know, talk to us about using equitable and inclusive and professional language uh, whenever you're writing about a candidate. So thank you for this opportunity. It's been wonderful to see you. Wonderful to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Beth. Podcast producer Casey Conlon here. Just wanted to make sure you were reminded that our newest faculty factory book, The Academic Medicine Starter Kit, Timeless Tips and Guidance for Early Career Faculty Members is now available by visiting facultyfactory.org. You can find it on the home page there. I also wanted to remind you that this podcast that you're listening to as of September 2024 has had nearly 89,000 total downloads and more than 15,000 total YouTube views. Faculty Factory website site has drawn more than 49,000 web visits from users in 122 different countries, and we'd like to invite you to be a guest on our show. So please visit facultyfactory.org, send us a message there, or reach out to the show directly, facultyfactorykim at gmail.com. Please reach out there if you'd like to be a guest or to nominate someone in our academic medicine community to be a guest on our show. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.